I have a big sign on my laptop that says start the recording, but it's behind this screen, so I was just about to forget. So uh, welcome, everybody, to our short course on GNSSIR, GNSS Interferometric Reflectometry. Um, this will be about a two-hour session. Um, I think I already said my name is Christy. I'm going to start out with a short introduction. Then I'm going to put Felipe on, um, on deck there to talk about background and theory. And he has a really nice overview of the basic concepts that are important to understand for the method. And then uh, we'll probably just go ahead and take a short break at that point, even if it's only 30. I don't know how long you're speaking, Felipe, but I, I think maybe take some questions in the Q&A. But uh, at that point, maybe we take a break and then I'll start. And mine's all practical. It's <laughs> it's not the theory, really. It's just sort of how do you take the theory that Felipe talked about and turn it into uh, a practical software. So at this point, um, I'm gonna try to share the screen. Let's see how that, okay. And, and of course, silly me, I forgot to uh, leave the presentation open. So let me open my presentation to the welcome sign. And then let me try to do that again. Share the screen. And uh, why is that uh, on basic? Oh, here it is. Day one, welcome. All right. I went to the last slide first, but let me go ahead and start it. Can everybody see a lovely picture of the water with a welcome and a sponsored button? I think that's okay. So again, uh, welcome. Uh, my goals for this talk and this short class is to uh, help you understand why this method works. Like I said just now, Felipe is going to talk about why theoretically, <clears throat> and then I'm going to start on how you can compute this. And then tomorrow, Simon Williams is going to take the lead on explaining the details for water. And then um, um, I'll finish out with some examples. Um, but ultimately, uh, I think it's important to do something more than just listen to theory. It's fine for someone to tell you can do something, but it's much more, to me, enjoyable to actually be able to do it yourself. So there is some software we've developed that'll help you do that. Uh, I hope there are no snow and soil moisture people here today, or if you are those people, you're interested in maybe water levels, because that's all we're doing. We're going to do lakes and rivers and tides. Um, and um, as I said, today it'll just be me and Felipe. And tomorrow it'll be Simon to start off. Then I'll give some examples. Then Simon again will take the, the lead to talk about his efforts at um, the permanent service for mean sea level, which is really a really nice summary of this method and how it's being applied on a vast scale. Um, Makan Kargar is going to, here at Uni Bonn, is going to talk about a working group that he is leading. Uh, it's sponsored by the IAG, and uh, I think he has some ideas on ways that you can participate in that working group. And then I want to just leave with some ideas about what, what do you do now? I, I hope I've given you some ideas on how to use this software, but um, I hope that you would consider be, becoming part of a community that's working on this together. Um, I think if we help each other, we're going to do a lot better and be more productive. Some general information. Um, you have, if you want to pose a question, um, pose it to the Q&A. And um, my co-host, Simon and, and Makan and, and Felipe, will try to answer those questions in real time. And if not, we'll try to catch up with them before the break and then after the end of the second part of this session. I've had questions, I understand. Uh, I realize this is too early in the morning for many people. I hit the button that says we're recording this. So as far as I know, everything's fine and we're gonna save that and post it on YouTube. Uh, the slides will also be posted. Um, 
I, if I forget to say thank you to people, it's not because I'm not thankful. It's just forgotten. There's a lot of people that have helped develop this software. And even if they didn't write code, I've gotten a lot of feedback from people on features. So I would encourage you to join GitHub so you can post pull requests and issues online. That makes it a lot easier for us to respond to your uh, questions. And uh, I just want to leave this up there, really. There are no stupid questions about Python. That would be my mantra. I've been teaching myself Python for the last three years, and I'm still learning almost every day. OK? And uh, there's some a link here. I'm going to stop there. I'm going to say stop, share, and I'm going to hand it off to Felipe. I think you're muted. Yes, uh, thank you, Christine. Let me share my screen while I welcome everybody. And uh, can you see my slides now? Yes. All right. So let's uh, jump uh, and get started. So, uh, this presentation is based on an encyclopedia chapter that you can download online and please do so because it has all the equations and the details. Here it's more of an overview, something that can fit under one hour. Um, I hope everybody is, is uh, a little familiar with the GPS and GLONASS and Galileo and Redu. Uh, let me just remind you that these satellites, they are in a medium Earth orbit, which means they their orbital period is about 12 hours. So while the Earth does one rotation, they do two. Um, and also they are in, in orbital planes that are inclined. And that is relevant for us because it leaves a gap, a hole, near the celestial poles. You'll see that in a moment, the consequences in terms of reflections. And um, for some um, equipment, it does only GPS. So you, are, you have uh, about 30 satellites. It, it's always better to have GPS plus GLONASS plus Galileo and everything else so that you can take up to four times the number of satellites and that's increases your your temporal resolution when sampling water water level um, these are sky plots something that you would uh, see uh, looking up so if you are on the north pole you would see the the celestial pole right at zenith that's where the the gap exists if you are on the equator then you you have half a hole due north and due east and for most folks at mid latitudes you have uh, um, one hole towards the nearest uh, geographical pole and normally we we take mostly the low elevation satellites and we'll see why in a moment um but keep in mind, you have to consider this when selecting a place to put your antenna, right? You, you want it facing south if you were in the northern hemisphere to maximize the reflections on the water. Now, uh, try to map the sky plot to the ground or to the water. Uh, in front of you, and basically you, you you need this equation. It gives the radius or the horizontal distance based on your vertical distance to the water, and that's the tangent of elevation angle. So the lower a satellite is in the sky, the farther the reflection is from you. Uh, saying another way, if the satellite is at zenith, the reflection is, is at nadir, at your foot. So um, 
it, it advances like in arcs. And these arcs, they are formed as the satellite rises first, reaches a culmination point, near zenith, and then eventually it sets, just like the sun does, but much faster. We're talking a few hours, it does one arc like this. Some are lower arcs, some are higher arcs, um, and the same satellite will appear twice a day, and uh, often in different azimuths. So this picture, when I'm talking about reflection points, this is uh, all under uh, geometric optics, right? So we assume the electromagnetic radiation travels in a, in a ray. And so this ray has no thickness. It's, it's a simplified picture. It, it allows us to easily calculate the, the specular points, but it's not physical because uh, this specular point has no area on the surface. It's not as if you put your, you dig a hole around the reflection point. That's not going to annihilate the reflection, right? So there is, there is a bigger picture around this, which comes from physical optics that will give you the thickness of the ray. So this is called the Fresnel uh, zone the fr for a, a satellite. Um, you have one uh, footprint for each satellite that is visible at the same time. For, so, for example, right now we have probably 10 satellites visible, and each one will have their own reflection point, and will have their own uh, Fresnel zone around them. Okay, here on the top right corner, I made a simplified picture for a whole day. So for the satellites that would be higher up in the sky, their Fresnel zones is smaller and it's closer to the antenna. And as the satellite goes lower in the sky, the ellipse gets more elongated, gets farther from you and gets bigger in size. And this, this is, uh, this ari arises naturally from, uh, a reflection arises naturally from scattering occurring across the whole surface, right? It's it's not as if the the transmitting satellite knew where you were and beamed the laser. No, it it illuminates the whole Earth. It doesn't care about us down Earth, and then the reflection will naturally occur at the point where these scattering wavelets on the surface they are. Uh, similar, so we will we'll call this uh, uh, coherence. So when, whenever the these uh, physical wavelets uh, scatter similarly, they will add up coherently. They will reinforce each other, and that's how a specular reflection is born. Okay. So in the previous slide, I told you about a specular point. Now I'll tell you about the Fresnel zone. But again. These are geometrical simplifications. It's not as if the area just outside the Fresnel zone didn't matter. It does matter, it's just that it, it matters less and less as you move away from the specular point. And the tricky part is you cannot truncate this illumination function, right? It has to do a, a gradual tapering. If, if, for example, you have a cliff and you're Fresnel zone, even the fifth or fourth Fresnel zone is truncated, then you no longer have a specular reflection, then you have a, a diffracted array. Okay, so we always assume a, a, a very large reflecting surface that can fit the first few Fresnel zones. And that has important consequence for the kind of water bodies that we can uh, sense. We cannot do a tiny creek. We need a, a minimum uh, a, a size for the river to fit the Fresnel zones. Uh, and, and at this point, you might be wondering, wait a minute, um, when I calculate the, the physical thickness of the ray, does it matter which uh, electromagnetic wavelength 
am I using? And the, the answer is yes. So if you are using GPS L1 or GPS L2, then the thickness will change a little. Um, and and so, so keep in mind, we are, many of you may come from a, a geodesy or, or positioning background, uh, but we are straddling in the remote sensing area also. So everything that can be said about uh, radio waves is useful for GNSS reflectometer. So keep in mind, we're using radio waves the same as used in Wi-Fi or cellular networks. And the wavelength is about 20, 25 centimeters. And that gives you a sense of the, the scale, the spatial scale of obstructions that matter. It's not the tiny stuff. It's not the huge stuff. It's things that are around uh, human scale, let's put it, OK? Um, and another important characteristic of uh, radio waves is the polarization. GPS and GNSS transmits in, in circular or uh, polarization, right-handed. And when it hits the surface, it spawns two reflections, always one similarly right-handed and another one opposite left-handed. And the proportion between the two depends on the angle of incidence on the surface. Okay, if, if uh, it's, it's mostly uh, near normal incidence, then the right-handed becomes completely left-handed. If it is near grazing incidence, very low elevation angles, then the right-handed remains essentially right-handed. And if you are uh, at slant incidence, then you have uh, uh, both present at the same time. The antenna will be responsible for mixing these two. And normally, the antenna will try to avoid the reception of uh, reflections, because that's that's bad for positioning. So in reflectometry, the worse the antenna is, the better result we get. Okay. Uh, let me briefly put this in context of other GNSS remote sensing capabilities. Uh, radio occultation is very, very successful. Um, it has commercial applications. And the, the eventually, we, you, you have uh, a reflection also present in the occultation profile when this tangent point is lowered uh, enough. So that's bad for them. They they normally discard occultation events that are contaminated with reflections. But those were one of the few first demonstrations of uh, GNSS reflectometry from space. And and of course, from a ground-based station, the same ones that we use for reflectometry, it is used for atmospheric sensing as an integrated quantity of uh, water vapor or electron density. So in terms of a GNSS reflectometry, normally you, you see folks using two antennas, one looking up to see the transmitting satellite. That's the direct link. And another one uh, pointing down or towards the horizon to pick up the reflection. And that's that's not something that you can purchase online, right? That's It's a customized, highly customized research grade um, equipment. So um, it works very well. Uh, it, it has been demonstrated from uh, orbital platforms. So you have a transmitting satellite and you have a receiving satellite and the reflection is, is, is coming from Earth. So those are huge distances involved. Also being demonstrated from airborne platforms and, and ground-based. But here in, in interferometric reflectometry, we will be using commercial off-the-shelf antennas and receivers. So 
we do not try to track the direct separately from the reflected waves. We, we sense always their combination. Right? And we call that combination of multiple paths, a multi-path. So it's a multi-path wave. The main path, the, it's, it's the direct one, it's the shortest one. Uh, it's a nearly straight line between the satellite and the receiver. It, it has a little bending because of uh, refraction. And then you have the indirect or the reflected one. And there can be second, third, and so on reflections. Um, for water level, we assume there is only one dominant reflection because that's what happens if the surface is, is flat and it's also leveled. So gravity tends to do that for water. So water is probably the easiest reflector because as I said, it's flat and it's leveled. So we can assume there's only one reflection and it's the strongest one. If you were doing um, snow depth, it's a very similar altimetry application, but then you have to account for the ground topography. I have a little hill, it will seem as if snow is thicker, but it's not, it's just the underlying ground, it's, it's, it's high. Okay, so we can use uh, geodetic equipment, we can use navigation equipment, lower cost, and it works well. As I said before, um, multipath is bad for positioning. It will corrupt your uh, coordinates. It will make your uh, coordinates to shift randomly. And so they, they invest a lot. Sometimes the antenna costs more than the receiver. If you're talking about choke rings, they're heavy, bulky, but they work well to uh, suppress those reflections coming from negative elevation angles, except it does so assuming the reflected sur reflecting surface is, is made of a metal. If you are uh, if you have water or 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 soil, then remember the polarization. The polarization no longer uh, totally shifts from right to left handed. And then even these expensive choke rings, they are not enough to suppress reflection. So we can still do GNSS interferometric reflectometry with continuously operating reference stations. As long as we have unobstructed direct visibility to the water surface, then we're good. And there's another requirement for the water to be reasonably calm. So no breaking waves, no surf zone. And we'll see why in a moment. Um, I, I like big pictures, so please bear with me as I as I mentioned some of our distant uh, relatives. You may have heard of uh, INSAR, Thermometric Synthetic Aperture Radar. That's also uh, based on the same type of uh, radiation. It also it is also based on on um, excuse me, on interferomet interferometry, but then they do, uh, they make pictures. So it's an imaging technique. Here we, we do not resolve pixels. It is as if we image that single pixel over time. Think of it like this. It's still remote sensing. It's just, it's just non-imaging remote sensing. It's more similar to radar altimetry. Those that do a uh, sea level, they uh, beam down and get the reflection of the the water, and so that that's more similar to us. Except the our geometry is, is always slant. Okay, so I I like to call it a a, a radar because it is based on artificial or or man-made radio waves. So it's not something that naturally emanates from the ground, but it's not us who transmit the radio waves. It's it's somebody else. So the GNSS satellites transmit the way the radio waves for free. We pick them up. It's a type type of radar. It's just not, not monostatic. It's bistatic. 
So that opens up a whole literature if you are interested in scattering models uh, when the reflection comes from the from the surface or something underneath. For water, it's it's easy because it's a thick reflector. It's always from the water air interface. But if you had snow, then you may get some reflections from the bottom. All right, so getting more practical, this is the main observable or the only observable that we'll be talking in this course. Uh, folks who have a positioning background are familiar with uh, pseudo range and carrier phase. We don't use anything like that. We use uh, carrier to noise density or signal to noise ratio. And that's a measure of the power, the reception power. And this power, if if you were receiving only the direct wave, it would be uh, driven mostly by the antenna gain pattern. So you'd see this trend for higher satellites, the antenna bore site amplifies reception. But then you get these funny oscillations. And these funny oscillations, they are not just the reflections, but they are the the interference between the reflections and the direct wave. Okay, so so the ups and downs they come from this term, this trigonometric term, which is driven by a phase. And this phase offset, which are called the interferometric phase, is how much the reflected wave is behind the direct one, which is always the 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 shortest one, right? And it is an oscillation, and it's also damped. So the amplitude is greater at lower elevation angles where the polarization are similar. So when the polarization is similar, the antenna amplifies both direct and reflected waves similar, similarly. Um, and, and for higher elevation angles, it disappears. That's why we normally focus for at lower elevation angles, especially when we're dealing with uh, geodetic antennas. If we're using a navigation antenna, it can go up to maybe 60 degrees. And it will probably have to stop because the reflection is coming from your feet. And you have a tripod. And you have uh, some junk around the your installation. Remember, the the reflection point will be very close to you. You 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 want some distance, right? Normally, you don't, don't put the antenna right in front of the water. There's a little uh, sand beach or some distance. So if you want to make sure the reflection is hitting the water, otherwise you'll be getting the beach level, which which doesn't change much. And Christine and and Simon will show you some great examples. All right, so keep in mind, even though we measure only uh, a quantity proportional to power, we are sensitive to phase effects. So that's, that's, that's an interferometric technique. We can get very um, precise centimeter level uh, results because the wavelength is about 20, 25 centimeters. So even if you have a fraction of a wavelength, you are, you are in, in good position. Now, again, if we can assume the, reflect, the reflecting surface is flat and leveled, then the excess distance from the reflected wave is simply two times your antenna height above the water multiplied by the sign of elevation angle. Super simple. It comes from a mirror image. Imagine your antenna is, there's a virtual uh, antenna under your feet and, feet and uh, the same satellite, you, you are, we assume the satellite arrives as a plane wave. So up to the point where the two rays, the virtual ray and the real ray are parallel, there is no excess distance. And then from that point on, the reflected wave would travel a little more than the direct one. 
it's it's equivalent to hit the virtual antenna or to bounce from the surface and hit the real antenna here. It's just a, a geometrical trick to get the reflection. All right, so that's that's the 95% of your phase or 99% of your interferometric phase is this geometrical uh, distance, excess distance. There is a tiny bit that comes from the surface. So the, the reflection coefficients, they are not uh, just a real number. It's, an, uh, it's a complex number. It has real and imaginary part. The imaginary part comes from the surface conductivity. So um, if the water salinity is greater, et cetera, et cetera. And also from a, uh, a little bit from your antenna radiation pattern the phase pattern and the gain pattern, yes? But for altimetry, normally we, 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 we fix, we focus on the 99%, which is the geometric part, and the remaining the reminder we'll have to consider in the future. Uh, this interferometric power is, is how weak your reflection is compared to your, the direct reception and for a satellite on the horizon at zero elevation angle, the ratio is one. This is in, in decibels, sorry. Uh, meaning the reflected wave is as strong as the direct one because of uh, similar polarization and similar gain applied to it. And also uh, a very strong reflection coefficient for, for grazing incidence. Intuitively, you have to think that for 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 a very low elevation angles, you cannot distinguish between the reflected ray and the direct ray. They are nearly parallel. There is the reflected is not uh, a lot delayed compared to the direct one. They they also they their polarization is is very much alike. So that's why it works so well at low elevation angles. Now the surface material, uh, you you don't need to worry as long as it doesn't change. If you are always doing uh, fresh water, then you just remove a constant bias and that's fine. However, if the water freezes up, then ice has a different uh, dielectric permittivity compared to uh, liquid water. Then you have uh, uh, a slightly different interferometric phase. Okay, so not all materials are, are born equal. We see that that's very important for soil moisture when the soil dries up or get hit with uh, precipitation. Another important effect, and here I'm probably going too fast, but I'll leave more time for Christine is uh, wind waves. Uh, the perfect reflector is a mirror. So we call it specular, means mirror-like. So if you have no winds, calm water. Uh, however, if the wind starts to, to blow, then you have uh, uh, tiny waves that will make the uh, reflected wave weaker. And the reflection is weaker because we need a coherent reflection. If, if the reflection is, is incoherent, let me go back here. In, in this interference uh, equation, if this phase has zero mean, then this trigonometric term is zero. And you would see only the trend shifted up a bit, but you would see no oscillations. And these oscillations, they are what allow us to do altimetry. Okay, so the phase has to be relatively stable. And that's what that's the definition of a coherent reflection. It's a stable, predictable phase relationship. And wind waves are are, are the main cause of random surface roughness in water sensing. So um, sometimes you have a site which is nice when it, the wind is low, but 
when the wind picks up, then you have fewer use for reflections, right? Because the one that was barely strong enough no longer is. So it it uh, the dampening that would see in the oscillations it would uh, get even more damped. And that affects mostly the high elevation satellites. And that's yet another reason why it works so well at near grazing incidents. Here, uh, sigma H is the height and standard deviation. So very simply, take a profile of your water level. It can be either a spatial profile if you cut a cross section, or it can be a, a temporal profile if you are sampling in one point over time. Take a mean, the mean will affect your antenna height, but the standard deviation will affect the uh, interferometric power. Now, this is this is the most important slide, probably. If you only if you only remember one. Thing, it is uh, the altimetry retrieval. Uh, here I have two antennas, one uh, maybe at five or six meters and another one at one and a half. And they will sense the very similar antenna radiation pattern, very similar uh, surface reflection coefficients, but the geometric phase will be drastic, drastically different because remember it's two times age sine of elevation angle. And what we'll per perceive in the SNR observable is an increase in frequency, in oscillation frequency as the antenna height increases. So again, if your antenna is fixed and the tides are changing, it is as if your antenna height is changing. Okay, so you, you think of it as a vertical distance. All right, don't get too hung up on the terminology. Think of it as a vertical distance. And if you want to have uh, the water level, then you, you fix a datum point, like mean sea level, for example. And then you take the negative of your antenna height, make your... Uh, to make the water level uh, look look as if you would uh, get from a tight gauge. And you hear throughout these two days various methods of doing this uh, altimetry retrieval. But at the end of the day, if you had enough eyeballs, you could do it visually. You just need to stare at this interference pattern and count the number of oscillations. I will do with the red one. So count with me, zero, one, cycle, two cycles, three cycles, and maybe four cycles, okay? That's the numerator in this fraction. So it's at half of a wavelength. So 20 centimeters becomes 10, four cycles. And then in the denominator, you have the difference in sine of elevation angle. So I'll go from sine of, uh, 60 degrees minus sine of five degrees. And voila, that's in meters and that's your antenna height. As simple as that. Everything else that you hear is ways to make this automatic and more robust because the picture is not as, as clean as in simulations, you get random noise, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, but we are counting oscillations. Or if you come from physics, we're counting frames also, uh, uh, interferometric fringe because that's what it's like an oil on water uh, interference pattern. Now, uh, if you remember from your signal processing class, you take a, a single sinusoid, a pure sinusoid, run a full Fourier transform, you get a, a single peak. That's the Dirac delta. Uh, what we have in practice is, is this damped oscillation over a, a trend. So we detrend de this, we lower it to a zero mean level, and the spectrum will, will be still a peak, but it, it, it will have some shoulders, okay? And you always want this peak to noise level as high as possible, 
that's that's uh, that means a, a strong spectral reflection. Okay, you see a lot a lot of this today and tomorrow. So that's the main way of automatizing altimetry retrieval is via spectral analysis. The trend SNR and pick this pick the frequency of your strongest tone. And here it's a frequency between quotes because it's not in hertz, it's not in radians per second, it's in meters. Okay, and that's that you may think of it as a spatial frequency. Okay. Um, and here in this case, it's around 1.5 meters, and that was about the tight level of that location. Uh, this is probably the most dense slide. It's just something that you have to keep in mind. If you keep moving the antenna higher up and up on a tower, then eventually you, you, you get excited and put on a, on a, on a cliff. And you are not uh, five meters, but you are 50 meters. And then you ask yourself, how high can I go? And there is a limit to it uh, because the sampling rate, it may not be enough to resolve the uh, SNR oscillations. So if you go online, you can calculate this. And you, you, if we're always sampling at one second, then you are probably fine for any, even for a cliff. But at, at some time, if you if you work if, if you want to save a bandwidth and sample once every ten seconds, then you are will be limited. All right, let me grab a sip of water, and I I told you spectral analysis normally suffices. But if you want, you can fit the actual SNR data and resolve the the amplitude dampening. That's useful if you want to do, for example, uh, wind wave retrieval. So significant wave height. There is there, there has been several demonstrations of using Genesis IR for uh, significant wave height sensing, and that's done mostly uh, via the amplitude dampening. Uh, it requires a little more care with the fit. You don't want to get too uh, confused with the antenna gain pattern. Uh, so, so keep in mind, there's always this trend. And the trend comes from the gain pattern. If, if you tilt the antenna sideways, this trend will change. Okay, this is assuming uh, looking up. The amplitude is driven mostly by the roughness, which is the wind waves. And the phase rate is the reflector height or the antenna height. Now, keep in mind, you have, you have what we estimate is an apparent height. It is 99% the geometric height, but it has 1% of other stuff. And other stuff is atmospheric refraction, the antenna phase pattern, the antenna gain pattern. And the main other effect that you have to consider is the vertical velocity or the height rate. It, it, it will bias your results if your tides are large enough. This is from a, a 2013 paper in Alaska, Christine and colleagues. Uh, we have demonstrated the importance of uh, applying a correction for the height rate, that's age dot, that's in meters per second. And it will differentiate between ascending or rising satellites and descending or setting satellites, which is uh, described by E dot, that's uh, elevation rate in degrees per second, right? So with that, I will stop and take any questions you might have, or we can take a break. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, let's see if there's questions. Um, uh, why don't people uh, put out questions for Felipe? Um, someone asked, what does it mean to detrend SNR? Um, so I'll go ahead and let Felipe answer that. What did you mean when you said detrend SNR? 
You're muted again. You you make it zero mean so you you lower this to uh, be near the zero level. That, that's all. I don't know if somebody can uh, jump in and help me explain the different words. I'm, I'm afraid I'm just with no, no, uh, it's um, myself. I will use the same terminology. Uh, sometimes I call it removing the direct signal. Uh, here it's very, it very clearly looks like a just hitting a line. Typically, I I remove a small order polynomial, and uh, people have certainly written papers about being smarter about it and. I guess at this point of my life, I just say, submit it as a pull request and we will add it <laughs> to the software as an option. There's certainly you know, other ways to do these things. And I appreciate that Felipe showed the, uh, the one he's showing here, which makes it clear that you know, the periodogram approach or the spectral analysis approach isn't the only way. And tomorrow I'll be showing you examples of another way that kind of follows on some of the things Felipe is talking about. So uh, we're giving you a, I, I think we're you know hitting 95% of it maybe, but there are certainly applications where more work is needed or more care. I, I think that was the right word he used. You, you need to pay more attention to certain things. So most of what he's shown, the software as it exists today takes care of it, but could it be done better? I think in, in many cases, yes, and uh, certainly, the care of identifying when things have gone wrong is always something we we worry about because we want to be able to trust the results. Um, but I, I do like that he also called out, you know, we are counting cycles. I mean, we're estimating frequencies, but um, at the end of the day, you could also just look at the data and do what he just said. And um, you know, most people in GNSS don't realize that, that that's what multipath looks like. And and uh, so, you know. uh, is there anybody else? Uh, so I do see something here. To compare the response of a signal, reflected signal between ocean waters and waters of a lake. Uh, I'll let Felipe answer this one. He asked, because I know you know the answer, does the salinity of the water- Yes, <laughs> that's a common question. Uh... Does salinity matter? I, it's a tiny bit. It, in principle, it does matter, but uh, we are not right. We are not there with the sensitivity to pick up that. Maybe if you turn the antenna upside down or have a custom antenna to, mm, not a commercial antenna will be able. No. Um, I think at least for what I'm for this audience. Uh, the big signal you will see is from the wind. Uh, you can often see the reflections anyway, as Felipe showed, even when things are quite rough at the very lowest elevation angle, you can often still see reflections. But um, the big thing we see are in, um, is in polar applications where you know the water surface freezes in the winter or lakes that are in the mountains. That's really an obvious bias. And um, uh, that's that's a very clear one. If it's a very simple uh, change to an ice surface, the bias might be simple, but if it's floating and that ice surface grows over this the winter season, that that's a more difficult um, bias to remove. Um, or as we like to say, it's an opportunity. Right, Felipe? If it's <laughs> doing something not normal, but people like, for example, Felipe showed how the reflections go away when it's windy. Okay, that's bad, but if you want to marry, if you want to measure a significant wave height, that should make you very happy. Because that's actually pointing what Felipe is doing is pointing to the way that th this methodology could be used for measuring significant wave height. Um, there's some other questions here. What kind of equipment is used to get the power of both? Uh, we, okay, so there's a bit of confusion. The, the receiver measures both of them. He, we're measuring the interference between the two, period. So that we don't yeah. measure them, we don't measure them separately. We get out the interference. And, and, and that's important uh, uh, because you have to wait a few uh, minutes or maybe one hour to to build the interference pattern. 
it's not with a single data point that you can estimate height. You have to wait for it to complete a few cycles. And that's that's essentially uh, uh, the, the Nyquist thing, right? You have to resolve at least two cycles to get the frequency right. And that has influence on how fast you can sample water level changes, right? If you are doing uh, GPS only, you can do maybe once every half an hour. If you are doing multi-GNSS, then you can do every few minutes. But for each individual satellite, you have to wait tens of minutes, maybe up to an hour to get, uh, depending on, on your water level and your antenna height. But it's not with a single uh, point measurement that you can do this. I mean, and, and, and this is a follow up to what Felipe is saying, but you know, sometimes people ask me how tall to make their antenna or worse, they show me what they already built. And it's, you know, a meter off the water or maybe a meter. These are terrible locations for water measurements because Felipe just showed you, you have to get, you know, a fair number of cycles. He we just said how many. And the shorter your antenna, the longer you have to wait. And, and so if you're trying to measure sea level, I don't, I, you know, you should be taller. You know, personally, eight meters is nice for me. I just kind of a nice height. <laughs> but it is also true. Sometimes I, I don't know if any of these people are on the call, but I do get asked by people sometimes that I, I call them this extreme GMSSIR community. You know, they have these really, really tall, they're on a cliff, they're on they're on a mountain near a glacier. They want to measure um, mountain lakes or something like that. And, um, you know, they're 200 meters tall. So for them, sure, they might get measurements every minute, or <laughs> right? So they're in a different regime. But for most people that have their GPS or GNSS receivers near the water, you want to have them at a height that's going to allow you to resolve the water fairly quickly. I mean, you don't want to wait an hour if you don't have to. Um, I have a question here about the equator. Is it? Could you elaborate on the issue of the method at the equator? And I would let Felipe answer this as the expert, as the one living by the equator. But I would say as people that we started this technique and tested it at mid-latitudes, it is a shock to see how long it can take some of these arcs to go and to finish their rising or setting. And um, I, I would say you can obviously use the method at near the equator. That's not the issue. The issue is what kind of temporal variability will you have? And if that temporal availability is large, um, you might have to change your data analysis scheme and use smaller arcs or you know use Felipe's method where you do a, a fit of the data yourself rather than use this software we've developed. I mean, there, it just depends, but I'll let Felipe and, say and, and keep in mind if the satellite has to change in elevation angle. Yeah. So if you are looking in the sky plot, it has to go radially from uh, inside out or outside in. If, it's, if it does a circle, shifting just azimuth, then you don't, you no longer see any oscillations in SNR. That's why equatorial sites are more challenging because they tend to avoid looking at it, just says shoot straight up and then they keep doing circles and it's a bit uh, unnerving, but hey, it works. I mean, I, so I've, uh, I, I've done those sites and you have fewer measurements, but do I have enough to measure tides? Yes. Do I have enough to measure lake levels? Yes. So I, it just depends on the ex particular site you're using. Um, I have a relatively difficult site Simon and I have looked at uh, in North America where there's just this tiny, it's a different problem, but you have this tiny azimuth region, but it's good enough. I mean, if you average uh, 10 good measurements, I mean, okay, it's not like a good site that might have 300 retrievals, but you know, if 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 you're the only measurement that we have, then that's the one people are going to use. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm not gonna stop the, um, I'm not gonna stop the recording. Uh, yeah.
there was one last question. Okay, I would like go to ahead. That one, uh, asked about uh, Fourier or wavelet for a frequency. Um, here, um, it depends on your noise level. The answer Why don't you is, repeat the question again? Because I didn't yes, Which one uh, will be better to for frequency analysis for here or wavelet? And if you are if you have an, a nice clean, uh, then for here will suffice. Um, if you is wavelet analysis, and that has nothing to do with the physical wavelets that I was mentioning in physical optics. Here is a digital processing concept. It's useful mostly for uh, snow when you have nasty topography, but or if you have fast fast change in uh, tides, then the uh, wavelet analysis might have an edge. Okay, um, so I, I guess I was just gonna say, I'm not gonna um, stop the recording because I will forget to turn it back on, but I am gonna take five minute break. Everybody take a five minute break. I don't know how to turn on a clock, so I'm coming back in five minutes. That's all I'm going to say. Felipe, could you unshare your uh, screen and I'll queue up mine and then I'll come back in five minutes.
Okay, I'm going to start getting ready. Um, let me uh, share the screen. Day one, running the code. So let's see what happens here. Play on this Mac. Okay, can people see the running the code? Can someone unmute themselves and say they can see it? Felipe, yeah. you can see? Yeah. Okay. Um, is that about, I think it was about five minutes. It's a lot of stuff to cover. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, all right. Um, Felipe, by the way, there is a question in the Q&A that I think you'd be perfect to answer. It's at the, you know, maybe at the top. So uh, I'm gonna give you like a little bit of background on where the software came from, because I think it explains why it is the way it is, and maybe that can be helpful to you. Uh, well, it comes from this effort that Felipe worked on when he was a graduate student at the University of Colorado called PBOH2O. Uh, it was a group uh, based in Boulder, Colorado, that basically used this new technique, which at the time was just GPS, interferometric reflectometry. And we produced environmental products, and I've listed them there in black, from data collected by a, a new GPS network in the Western US, and it was called the Plate Boundary Observatory. And so sometimes you'll hear me referring to that, and I'm, I'm just referring to this earlier effort that was GPS only, Western US only, and never included water. Um, water was something that was worked on separately. Felipe was involved with that as well. Um, he's actually the one who introduced that H dot correction um, when we realized it was needed. And at that time, and we're talking 15 years ago, it was Fortran. The code we used to analyze that data was all done in Fortran. And I wrote that code with John Braun, who was at UCAR. And um, I used C shell scripts. That's what I was brought up in. And um, there was a lot of shell scripts, uh, all Fortran for the hard stuff. I mean, things were run by plain text files. And if you had told me about a JSON file, I would have looked at you blankly. Um, and we did use MATLAB uh, as well. And that was because I didn't have any students who knew Fortran. And uh, so everything was done in, and, and I, I realized I don't want to make plots in Fortran. So I was happy to do all the plotting in MATLAB. So it was a combination of a lot of different things. And uh, we had a great web programmer, so I'm just gonna call him out for that. And, and uh, so I didn't know how to do many of the things that was in that project. I knew how to do some of it, but you know, the web programming, I didn't know. Uh, Felipe is a far better MATLAB programmer than, than I ever was. Um, that project uh, ran till the end of 2017. Um, and we, Ported that code and commented it and made sure everything ran and we gave it to JPL. So that was a fully funded project. And I retired at that point and made my uh, translation codes for GPS data files, which are the data files called data formats called Rhinox. And uh, I put that code out in the public sort of before the whole open source thing was uh, as big as it is today, but it's there. Um, like I said, I was retiring. I took a tiny bit of the code and ported it to MATLAB uh, that did the periodograms uh, because I had um, I had colleagues, especially in the cryosphere community, that um, couldn't use the method. Uh, they, they just didn't have the background to do all the GPS Hard and and um, it's always easier to give people some code. And so I did do that, uh, but it wasn't that, that the, when we wrote that package, um, that MATLAB package, we made, stated this is not for water levels because we didn't have that, some of those corrections in it, like the H dot correction. But, but people ignored that and kept using the code anyway. Um, 
And, and, and as Felipe showed, we also looked at this whole Nyquist issue and uh, we took uh, the, the equations that Felipe had made that calculated the Fresnel zones and we put those in MATLAB as well. So that is where that code is. But you look at the date, it's 2018. Um, I wrote GNSS Reflect um, because I felt like there was a place for it that um, some of the knowledge we developed in PBOH2 was being lost in some sense because uh, uh, you know we hadn't made the codes public. The, the codes were just too ugly, as you can imagine, with a code that's run by Fortran, MATLAB, shell scripts, and, and so on. And we have never made our type gauge work done with Chalmers and PSMSL public. Uh, every time we did a paper, we Kind of would dust up, dust off our code, but it wasn't public. So um, I guess I decided I would take this up as as something to do, uh, and and we decided to use Python, and made a decision pretty early on that it would be open source on GitHub. Um, but. Python just isn't fast enough, in my opinion, to do the orbit calculations that we needed. So there is some Fortran in it, but it's uh, embedded. Uh, I found out also that if I told people they had to compile Fortran, they wouldn't do it. So we essentially are compiling that Fortran for you. Uh, again, um, not only could we now add water, perhaps, we could also make it multi-GNSS. Uh, PBOH2 was GPS only. It always was GPS only. And uh, no shell scripts is uh, is a good thing. I, I think those, gosh, let's get rid of those. So Python at least allows you to do things that do the same things as a shell script. And um, the reflection zones uh, have a couple new things that we put into that. It's available both on Python and, and via a web app. So another thing, um, originally, my view was, well, you should know how to get your own data. And that's just not very nice, uh, not very welcoming. So one of the things this code does is go get things for you because Python makes it easy to do that. So we go get the orbits for you. We go get files for you if you tell us which archive they're in. And um, I think there's over 15 archives now in our uh, code. Uh, originally, it was only gonna be Rhinex 2. Uh, don't worry about it if you've never heard of Rhinex, but basically this was the format developed starting in the 1990s. And this was the one it pretty much converged on before multi-GNSS became a thing. Um, it's, you know, it, it's okay, it's text, it's, written by Fortran programmers, which won't mean anything to you, but means something to me. Uh, we added RhinX3 because RhinX3 is superior for reflectometry. Um, but the irony is the first thing we do with those RhinX3 files is convert them to RhinX2. But that's just me avoiding coding. Uh, Makan Karagar added the NMEA format, which is what the real-time navigation users, the, those cheap chipsets often will give you data if you ask for it, but in this format, which I think is incredibly ugly. But, you know, if that's what people have, then that's possible to use in the software. Um, I made a decision that unlike PBOH2O, which did soil, moisture, snow accumulation, and vegetation, I was not willing to support the vegetation product for reasons I won't go into, but I did explicitly add water levels, which was never part of PBOH 2 o because I think it's a really interesting technique for that community. I think it has a lot to offer. Um, and I, I, I thought it was worth making it available. And I had a huge assist from Tim Dittman and Kelly Enlo on parts of this, and in particular, Read the Docs documentation has been a huge help. Um, you may not be familiar with it, but at least 
it gives us a way to maintain the code that I hope will make it uh, useful, you know, five years from now. Uh, if it had been left up to me, I wouldn't have helped anybody unless they were using Linux. <clears throat> and uh, again, it was thanks to Tim Dittman <clears throat> that we have Dockers because it means people with PCs and are using Windows, excuse me, <clears throat> can use the code. So that's been, I think, a huge thing to make it uh, usable to people. It's the only way we tell people we know it will work um, if you're using Windows. Um, Kelly Enlow uh, uh, built some Jupyter notebooks, and I'm not going to talk about those here. Um, Felipe's gone through the background, and I just want to repeat some terminology. Uh, I use the word reflector height as this h variable here. Uh, that's it. It's the vertical distance between the reflecting surface and the an antenna phase center. That's it. And since Felipe has explained to you about the interference patterns, I'm not going to go on about the, um, the blue and the red in the center of this plot, but basically we get an interference pattern in the SNR data. We use a periodogram to extract H, and then we move on. So again, the interference pattern is directly related to age, and Felipe showed that to you. Uh, it can be retrieved from SNR data. There are publications of people using this kind of technique with pseudo-ranging carrier phase data, but that's not what we do. I think this is a superior way to do it, to do it but if you want to try those other methods, you certainly can. And then the footprint Felipe showed you is depends on age, but it also depends on elevation angle. As he said, as you get closer to the antenna, your uh, footprint is smaller. And the reflection surface also has an impact. And I can't actually see what my own slide says, but that's okay. Uh, it, I can't see what it says. Um, visually, what are we doing? I showed you these this picture with some words. Visually, what are we doing? Here's an antenna, Peterson Bay. At on the left, H is large. On the right, H is small. Er, it's not small, but a small er. So we're going to use the SNR data to estimate those H's. And here's sort of a reality um, check. On the left, I've got three real observations where I, as Felipe and I would say, we detrended or removed the trend in the SNR data. And we've, S we've got SNR data on the left with three colors. And on the right, I've got tight gauge records in the dotted line from a NOAA tight gauge, and I've superimposed the reflector heights converted into a tide gauge number. So you go from frequencies to water heights, and then I've, I've plotted them here. So from low tide, if you have a lot of oscillations, low tide. Fewer oscillations, you have high tide. Um, so I did this by extracting the frequency from the data on the left. Uh, but how do I do that in practice? What's the best way to do that? Can you use all GPS sites to do uh, GNSSIR? Uh, can you use the same data as geodesists and surveyors, low-cost low navigation chipsets? And what's the fastest way to do it? Um, that may be relevant. There are ways to do things better, but they're slow. They're extremely slow. What frequencies should be used? How should you pick your reflection mask, by which I mean the area over which your reflectors are going to be used? What kind of quality control are you going to impose on these measurements? And what do you do with these H estimates, the height of the antenna above the um, surface? What are you going to do with them to turn them into tides or lake levels? Um, I would do want to say, I'm going to show you the command line version of the code but you absolutely can call these as a Python script. So it's very simple. If I've only got three required elements or three required inputs using the command line, you can call the exact same Python script or Python function within a Python script to call it. So uh, these are my steps, which I'm gonna go through one by one. So I'm gonna skip this. So first of all, you. 
make sure your site can even be used. Don't download years of data until you've established you have any hope of using it. Couple things, are you close enough to the water to be able to measure it? It's key. Is the sampling rate of the receiver high enough for the given water surface? And this is what Felipe has talked about. You know, being up on a mountain will have a very different response than being right next to the water on a dock. And this has to do with, did the owners collect the appropriate data? And that's partly due to the second. And if you can't answer yes to those questions, you really can't do anything with the data other than ask the owners of the station to change the sampling rate or to change the data they're saving. So I'm gonna give you some examples. Uh, this is from South Africa. And uh, uh, someone from the surveying network there sent me this photo and wanted me to measure soil moisture. And I was like, no, can't do that. And I don't even know why I thought I could possibly measure this water surface. I, it was craziness. Uh, but uh, I was kind of crazy. I developed a web app, and here's the address on the lower right. Um, and I've shown you that there's two parameters that are going to be important in making this map. The reflector height value, if your station is 6 meters or 8 meters or 10 meters, that, this is where you put it. If your station is at the ocean, you can use mean sea level. But if it's not, you've got to know how high it is. And then you can pick different elevation angles and you can pick different azimuth angles. Um, could someone unmute themselves and tell me whether, when I move this uh, uh, arrow around, can you see it? Yeah. Well, I'm sorry? I can see it. You can? Yeah. Oh, great. OK. so. Um, those are the parameters that I'm showing you this uh, web link. You're welcome to use this web app I developed officially. It's not part of the Python package. The Python package has a separate um, tool um, that was developed here at Unibon, and it makes Google Earth um, compliant files. So I, I tend to use this one if I want a quick answer. Make something that looks like this. Um, if you've started the software, you know that you know, there are different colors for different elevation angles. The yellow ones are five degree elevation angles. Blue is 10, red is 15, so on. Now, I knew that the reservoir at this point was about 25 meters above the water surface. And, you know, sure enough, the five degree and 10 degree ellipses look like they work. Now, that, this is about 80 meters from the shore, though. So you wouldn't know that it works, but you if you do the equations, it does appear to work. Uh, you can change the frequency. This happens to be L2 in GPS, and again, 25 meters. If you look, if you can see this on the um, screen, the yellow ellipses are actually hitting the land, as are the blue ellipses down here. So I'm gonna have to change the azimuths there. Um, so the next question is, is the sampling rate high enough so that we can actually, you know, avoid the Nyquist problem. And, and did the owners collect the appropriate data? And the question to the first one was maybe, and the second one, no. Uh, in particular, at this particular site, they were collecting one second data, I believe, for surveyors, but it was only L1, and there were no SNR data. And they weren't willing to add it. Um, they had a second data file with 30 second data, because that's what geodesists is like. And there were no SNR data, but no, there, excuse me, there were SNR data, but they didn't, they didn't include the high quality signals. So I could get high rate data, but no SNR data. I could get 30 second data with high, with low quality signals and, and probably a Nyquist problem. And this is the code that some of you might have seen. It's called Max Resolve Reflector Height. And it says, if you have 30 second data and you have elevation angles between five and 15 degrees, it says, and I put in 25 meters as what I'm trying to measure. It says for L1 data in these azimuths, I'm only going to be able to measure in these azimuths I won't be able to see anything beyond about 13 meters. 
So if it's really 25 meters up here, if this is the answer, I'm not going to be able to measure it. Not, I'm not going to be able to measure it with L1. I'm not going to be able to measure it with L1, 2, or L5. Now, this scales linearly. So if I could get them to collect 15 second files, everything gets multiplied by two. So this down here at 15 gets moved to 30. Well, then I should be able to resolve that. All the L2 data resolve as well. And in fact, uh, Simon and I have both looked at the data from this site and uh, you can retrieve reservoir levels with both L1 and L2C. Uh, these are um, empty spots are not the method not working. There's just no data, there were data outages. So this is an example of where, you know, someone had to actually intervene and ask people to change the sampling rate and to also track L2C. And they were perfectly nice about doing it. I wanna make that very clear. They were willing to do this, um, but sometimes you can't even find the right people to ask. Here's another example um, from Florida. I don't even remember the station name, to be honest. It's a very nice site. It's installed for geodesy. It can see the water, right? Just like the other site. I can see the water. Surely you can measure tides. Well, it's just not good enough. Uh, this is what those reflection zones look like for that site. It's three and a half meters above water levels. But the reflection zones are primarily to the south, which hit a boat dock, a parking lot, a parking lot, and then there's this tiny sliver in the northwest that partially sees the water. But again, as, as Felipe said, this is not an instantaneous method. I have to look at the data as the elevation angle changes. So I need all these areas in the ellipses. So again, this just doesn't work. Now it's a geodetic site, so it wasn't designed to work, but I'm just giving you an example. Here's another example where it partially works, and I kind of wanted it to work because I thought it'd be cool to have a new tide gauge in Costa Rica. Again, it's a very high quality site, has a very uh, expensive antenna and monument. And if you just look at the reflection zones, where again, yellow is five degrees, blue is 10, red, whatever, it, it works. And sure enough, I got reflections when I looked at the data, but then it didn't seem to work all the time. And the problem with my web app is it uses the photograph that Google Earth decides is the one you should use. And that's why the Unibon one that um, creates a I'm not sure what the name of it is, but it creates a file that you can put into Google Earth and Google Earth lets you change the date of the imagery. And this was the problem. Half the time it was low tide and there's a beach and the beach was overlapping those blue and red um, ellipses. So again, it's close to the water, but it either has to be taller or, uh, yeah, it needs to be taller. That would be it. So basic steps, you need data, but again, you need a site that works. That was number one. For the data to be useful, um, I need to have uh, a location. The header has a place where you're supposed to put the location of the site. And sometimes people don't put that in their data. I've already talked to you that sometimes people make files without SNR data. Again, that will fail. At least for my code, you have to follow the rules about naming your files. It's actually not required that Linux, you know, there's not, nothing about the inside of a file that requires you to have a certain file name. Of course, it's the outside of the file that's helping the computer codes. So if you don't follow the rules, I don't know how to find out certain things about the file. Excuse me, you're also gonna need orbits, but I've tried my best to make this invisible for you in that we go get the orbits for you. The basic steps are you 
decide where you want the reflections to come from. And that's going to be you picking azimuths and elevation angles. And that's why those uh, Fresnel zone maps, those reflection zone maps are used, is to let you decide, look, I can only use from azimuth 0 to 90, for example. Uh, you decide which frequencies to use, or you're going to use my default, which might not be what the ones you want to use. Now, you shouldn't worry about figuring out which satellite is rising and setting in those regions. That's the job of the code. And you shouldn't worry about the periodograms too much because, again, the code is supposed to do the periodograms for you. You don't have to know the frequency of GPS L1 or Galileo L2, or sorry, L5. I'm supposed to know that. So we're doing the mapping of frequency to age. Quality control, meaning you can trust your age values, and then you just do it over and over and over again, because that's it's not really that interesting to measure water level once. You want to measure it over and over and over again. So the building blocks of the code, if I had to pick three, this would be it. The first one is to translate the RINEX files, the GNSS files. When I say geometric angles here, I mean elevation angle and azimuth. A RINEX file does not have those. Uh, you'll notice I've added here NMEA to SNR because that code does exist, but I personally do not trust the azimuth and elevation angles in those files, and I don't think you should either. So we recompute those in this uh, module. Uh, these are, the, again, the four constellations we support. Um, we've developed this um, code called Quick Look that is supposed to give you visual feedback. It's not used all the time. It's only used at the beginning. And then sort of the workhorse is the word I would use for it. The one that does all the periodograms is called GNSSIR. And you make choices using this utility. And this is the one you're going to be using to measure water level. You try to figure out, do your results make sense? Do I want to change my strategy? And once you do that, quick look goes away. And at that point, you're really just, you've translated the files, you're done doing that, you estimate the reflector heights, make sure they pass quality control, you save them. And then in the code, you have three options. You can measure snow depth, <clears throat> volumetric water content, or soil moisture, and you can measure water levels. Now, this class is water levels, and I don't know exactly why, but I called those daily average and subdaily because they, they talk about the temporal resolution. And so that's perhaps not the best of names, but that's what they are. If you're doing a lake or a river, you're probably going to be able to use daily average without much else needed. If you're going to do tides, you should use subdaily. OK, so I'm going to skip this, I think. That's just details. Uh, so again, we use community standards. You have to have SNR data. You have to have coordinates in the file. Um, I have rules. <laughs> Somebody, people complain, but okay, I have rules. You have to follow community standards where you have a four character station name followed by a three character day of year. I don't know why. There's an extra there. I do know why, but it's not interesting. There's an extra space after that where I put a zero. This is so old that they use only two characters per year, and it's really sad, but that's the way they do it. And an O means it's an observation file. If it's Hadanaka compressed, it's got a D instead of an O. The Rhinex three file names are so long and complicated. I could never, I could give an entire lecture on them. We've documented it. NMEA has much uh, more sensible names, um, very similar actually to a RINEX file. Can you use your own data? Yes, you can, uh, but you still need to follow my rules. 
Um, that, that's the way that goes. So it has to have a position in the header. It has to have the right name and so on. So, I mean, I think in general, you should start with the cases where you know it works and then try your own data. Sometimes when you try your own data, uh, there's just one small little problem and, and, and it's hard to find that error. So using our examples can give you, I think, confidence. So I don't think you need to spend too much time on this stage. The input are these GNSS files. The output, I'm going to call an SNR file. And um, I'm going to mostly skip this. There's online documentation for the inputs. But basically, I need to know the year, the day of year, and the station name. And that's it. So here are some examples. Station name here is P041. I'm analyzing 2020, year, and day of year 132. You can also write a Python script that calls this code, and you say station equal P0141, year equal 2020, day of year equal 132. So you can also make a Python script to do this. It'll produce an SNR file. Uh, if, for example, you don't want to use the default archive, you know the data are at SOPAC, you can say that. We do allow RINAX3 data, and we like RINAX3 data, uh, but they have different conventions, and in particular, they have nine character station names. And the first four characters are just the ones the rest of us use from the old days. And I'm sure this 00, zero can become 01, 02. I'm not really sure. But the next three characters are um, this country name. So <clears throat> this particular station is in Australia. I say, give me this data from CDDIS archive. OK? Once I get that data, I save it in an SNR file with only the first four characters. I mean, it's fine for geodesists to have these nine character station names, but I'm just not going to perpetuate it here. All right, for local data, <clears throat> you make sure you put your Rhinox file in the correct place, and then you say no look true because you're telling it, don't go look for the data. It's on my computer. And for NMEA, I think you'll be best off using capital letters for your station name. It's not my preference, but that's the way I think you'll have the most success. Um, again, I don't say no look here because I don't know of anyone who archives NMEA data. It's a real-time uh, navigation uh, product. So I try to make the defaults make sense. So what's stored in an SNR file? This will look uh, familiar to you if you uh, look back to Felipe. Uh, this is actually the station P041. And the blue is the raw SNR data. And that's the total signal measured by a geodetic receiver. In this case, it's the L2C data, which means it's the GPS L2 data using the modern code. and I've put hours on the x-axis, even though I'm going to end up using sign of elevation angle in the code. And the dB hertz is just like what um, Felipe talked about. And the red part is what I want. Because remember how Felipe explained to you as the elevation angle as the satellite rises here, these oscillations are getting smaller and smaller. And ultimately, I'm not going to be able to see much about um, the surface. So what I store in the SNR file is, are these red data, along with the satellite number, the time of the measurement, the elevation angle, and the azimuth angle. And then the SNR data is the actual dB hertz. OK? So this is what SNR data look like in time domain. It's pretty similar to that earlier example I gave you for the uh, high tide, low tide. But in that case, <clears throat> of course, I'd taken out this big polynomial. <coughs> All right. So that's what I'm storing. And that's the data that will be used in the periodogram. 
I don't save this data here, and maybe I should have, but it just didn't seem necessary. You have the option of saving it. Um, just You just have to read the documentation. Um, so again, I'm not interested in the blue part, so I just say this is my rising arc and this is my setting arc. So as Felipe said, it's about an hour of useful data to count these oscillations. Now, this happens to be a soil site and it wouldn't be a very good type gauge site because it's only two meters tall. And down below is what it looks like as a function of elevation angle, all right? And here I've shown it as rising arc and setting arc, but you know you can't tell which it is unless you would look above. They just it's elevation angle and uh, SNR data, and the task of the code is to estimate the frequency of those oscillations. And then this is me showing you that impact. The rising arc is over here, about 180 degrees azimuth, and that setting arc. It's uh, it kind of. It's not as straight a line. The azimuth isn't straight down like it is in the south. Um, but it's showing you that, let's say this is satellite, I don't know, 12. And if the water surface is here in the south, we keep this arc. But if this is soil and we're trying to measure sea level, of course, we wouldn't want this one. So we set a mask that says, look, the water's just here. So ignore all the data there. All right, so where do the files live? I'm going to let you read the documentation. Uh, the quick look utility that I talked about takes an SNR file and actually estimates the frequency content of it. It looks in four different quadrants to kind of give you a sense of where things are. It computes a periodogram for all the rising and setting arcs that it finds. It has some defaults that aren't for sea level. Remember, this code is for snow, soil moisture, and sea level. And those may not be the values you want, but you can modify them. So I'm just telling you what it does. Um, I will skip that. I just, well, I guess the reason I had these red marks is just to show you some of these arcs are quite low in the sky, like this one here right, very low in the sky, and it might be almost impossible, well, it would be impossible to estimate a good frequency from such a small data set. And also these ones here have very short um, arcs. So when it, what comes out of that is gonna be a periodogram, and we're gonna have two ways of assessing quality. First of all, this periodogram, where's the answer? Well, as Felipe said, the answer is here on the x-axis. We look for the maximum value. Okay, it's 1.9 meters, it's right down here. We take the max and tell what X value it is. The two QC values are the amplitude, so right here, the amplitude of the periodogram, and how big the peak is with respect to the quote noise region. Okay, so that's gonna be important. So we call it peak to noise. Noise being actually the average value over an entire region, which you control. Um, why isn't there one special number? Um, uh, you know, to be honest, again, part of it is because we do snow, soil, moisture, and water. And so we haven't quite figured out how to set the defaults for those three cases. I've been thinking about ways to do that to make it better. Um, for right now, you're responsible. Uh, different receivers have very different qualities, and uh, I'm going to give you examples of that. Uh, peak, to noise, peak to noise is simple. It works pretty well, um, and it's the only metric we used in PBOH2O. Um, but th at the end of the day, what we have works pretty well, and what you should try to do is be consistent. That's the, the key. So again, quality control was easier for PBOH2O because all the stations were two meters tall. And so tides are a little bit trickier. So this is an example where I'm showing you, look, here's the SNR data on the top. I've changed it to be sign of elevation angle. So it's between five and 30 degrees. 
And I'm just pointing out that if you computed the average of this, of the oscillations in this area, shown by this red pinky area, the average amplitude of these sine waves would be different than if you only used these low elevation angle ones, right? The amplitudes here are bigger than the ones if you averaged over the entire arc. So that's the kind of thing that can influence your quality control. Um, this is another example where I'm just showing you that this elevation angle, excuse me, this group of periodograms was computed with all the data between 5 and 15 degrees. You see here the peak is well over 20. On the left, I'm using 5 to 25, and the highest peak you get is about 15. Well, that's just because you put different data into the periodogram. It can be the exact same soil, but you use different choices. Okay, what do the colors mean? I just like colors, and that's number one. Number two, every satellite has a different color here. And so if everything was blue, I just, I don't know, it might make it difficult to get a sense of how many are there. What is gray? Gray is a failed periodogram. It's a periodogram that doesn't pass your quality control. Why might it not pass your quality control? I mean, look at some of them are very broad, so they're noisy. Um, they have very low amplitudes, perhaps. This one doesn't have a peak at all. And why might that be? Well, they might be one of these small arcs. They might be one of these small arcs, things like that. So that's they're there so that you'll know that the code tried to find the right value, but it you failed. Um, yeah, so this again, if you say I want the noise metric to be measured over 20 meters, you'll get a different average than if you say the default. Again, peak amplitudes depend on the surface. Um, in this case, uh, it's soil. Do I tell you that? Yes, it's bare soil. You'll see the amplitude's about 12 and a half. This is ice. And you see the amplitudes are close to 25. Those are not the same surfaces. They have different dielectric constants. Um, you can also get different amplitudes at the same site, right? So this is a site in Greenland that, it's a great site. It's in Thule Air Force Base or nearby. So you can use it to measure tides. And instead of you having one nice peak at the same reflector height, which is what you would have for soil, um, here we're measuring tides. So the periodograms, which are the colors, they're at different heights because there are tides, the water levels change. Um, what I am showing you though is September 27th has different amplitudes than January 1st. Here the peaks are 25, and here the peaks are around 11. <clears throat> why? Um, because this is water and this is ice. Okay, so you should be aware, you know, just to keep that in mind. I'm going to skip the hidden quality control, but you have, you will have the PDF if you want to look at this. So. I'm going to first just show you a site on soil just so you can compare it with water because we only have about 15 minutes left. Um, this is what a soil site looks like, the periodograms. The quick look summary, it couldn't be more dull. It's just two meters, two meters, two meters, two meters. It's always two meters. Uh, blue means good, and you can see that all the peak to noise values are kind of uniformly good. In fact, they're all over six. The amplitudes are all bigger than the defaults. Okay, this is what a truly planar reflector looks like in all four directions. And we'll skip that. This is where I warn you about all frequencies are not the same. Uh, these are the L2C, these are the modern GPS L2 data periodograms, again for soil. Both have nice strong reflections. They pass the peak to noise um, test. This is what these are the same. This is the same receiver, the same soil, the same station, same receiver, 
The only difference is this is the data geodesists use, and it's called L2P. So it's the original P code. You no longer have a nice, narrow, beautiful peak. Your amplitudes are three versus 15 or 16. Uh, there are reasons it looks like this, and I'm not gonna talk about it here. I just, this is why I emphasize you should track modern GPS signals, L2C and L5. They're superior for reflectometry. They're also superior for positioning, but geodesists often continue to use L2P. Um, I show this to you with soil so you'll realize sometimes there's going to be issues with your water levels that you might think, oh, there's something wrong with my site. No, no, no. It's the way the constellation is set up. It has nothing to do with your work. It's just the fact that the satellites are inclined with respect to the equator. So in particular, right here, there's some, you know, there aren't very many retrievals. That's nothing to do with you. That just means that there aren't, those satellite tracks have not passed quality control because they don't rise high enough in the sky. All right, so let's talk about water. So I apologize, I'm getting the water pretty late. This is for Vessel. It's a river in Germany. And I got some Google Earth images which show you right now some of the problems with the site. Boats are bad. So in particular, I've looked at some sites where people park their boat right here, and that's bad. But at least on the Rhine, they're going by you usually. Uh, there also could be problems with reflection from, quote, the soil. So just things we need to keep in view, keep in mind. Here are my Fresnel zones. I used the reflection zone web app. I wasn't sure what the reflector height was, so I used 10 meters. I used originally 250 to 360, but you can see up here that I'm hitting the soil. And um, I'm using defaults between 5 and 15, which is usually pretty good for water. But you still need to check max resolve reflector height, this Nyquist thing that Felipe talked about. And in this case, we're going to use sample rate 15 just for that reason, that it, it's 30 seconds is not good enough. So you run Rhinex to SNR. Again, it's a Rhinex 3 file, so it has a very long name. You tell it, hey, you only want the 15 second data. I'm going to use the BFG archive, and then I'm going to run Quick Look. I'm going to use it with the defaults, and the defaults are 0 to 8 meters, and it doesn't look very good. There's some blue dots, but they're all down near like one meter. And I've been using the default elevation angles. Well, it's because I hadn't set the height restriction correctly. So now I'm going to use 20 meters. I'm going to say, look, tell me everything from 0 to 20. And it turns out the correct location of the re uh, reflections should be in the northwest, and that's exactly where they are. The azimuth is between about 270 and about mm, 330. These are the good reflections. I mean, these aren't bad reflections, they're just not water, right? Zero to 100, that's over here on the grass. So they're good reflections, but I don't want those reflections. I want these reflections. So it also means my original 10 meter guess was wrong. It's really on this day, it was 15. <clears throat> and so you can further restrict the azimuths and this will be the good region. <clears throat> we save our strategy. So in this case, I used quick look like this. Now I'm gonna save my strategy. I'm gonna say restrict the height region to five to 20. I don't want those bad azimuths, so I'm gonna restrict it 260 to 340. I'm gonna restrict the elevation angles. I'm gonna restrict the peak to noise. And again, I know the frequencies, but you can say, uh, what's the right word? All frequencies true, if you don't know them. And we'll skip that because I'm never going to get through these. I don't stop talking so much. We'll skip this. And the output basically is a bunch of numbers. Um, the files are all text only, either as a com comma separated value or plain text. 
Uh, I always write down what's in each column because it drives me nuts when I don't know where things are. Um, and I tell you which columns so you don't have to like count them. Um, and I try always to put the units. Now, if you find me not doing that, please tell me. Okay. <clears throat> I'll skip that. Um, the way I've set it up, you set up a strategy and that's what you use. And when you run GNSSIR, you're not supposed to straight change the strategy. But of course you can, um, and there are some ways to do that. Uh, once you think you know what you're doing, you can run your entire data set just by sending setting limits to the day of year. You can analyze multiple years, multiple days. Also, you could do this in a Python function. As I said, anything I'm writing here on the command line, you can write a simple Python script that says, yes, go from day of year 285, year 2023, to 2024, day of year M15. So you can do that in a Python script too. Once you've done that, you're going to move to the next level, which is turning this into an, sort of an ITRF-defined water level using either daily average or sub-daily. And that, that was very fast, for which I apologize, but that's the short version of how to run the code. Um, I hope, let me unshare. Um, I hope that those of you who wanted to see the things I skipped, you know, you can go back and look. I also just wanna say it's all documented. It's all documented. So you wanna know more inputs, you wanna see uh, more examples, it's all online. And I think with that, I'm going to stop and let Felipe or Simon read questions and we can all answer them. How about that? Okay, so I guess the first one is that we got still open. In the event of a wave, how to distinguish the real level of the lake if it is not stable? Case of Lake Kivu. What's stable mean in this case? I don't know. I mean, is it not stable on a five minute level or a one day level? Or I don't know what that means. I, I can jump in. Um... You're you're not going to see a one individual wave because it it is short lived. It has to be sustained for about one hour. So that's my take on it. I, okay, that's the <laughs> I wasn't sure what it meant. Um, to the person who asked, I did not find if you can define two sets of azimuth limits simultaneously. Yes, you can. The azimuth list. I think maybe I just put in two numbers, a beginning and an end. So you say beginning and end for your first set, and then the next set, the next set. You can actually put a, as many as you like, because that's life. Sometimes you're on a pier, and you can see to the east, and you can see to the west, but you can't see to the south because there's a boat, and you want to exclude that. So yes, the code does allow that. <clears throat> Okay, uh, next, uh, I have read several paper mentioned that the period of the GPS orbit is close to 24 hours, and hence impacting the tidal results of K1 and K2, etc. However, we usually use daily Unix files and generate daily results, so there are maybe boundary effects. Does this make sense? So do you have some plans to support three-day consecutive processing in GNSSL level? The important thing is how long is the arc used to estimate the reflector height, not the size of the Rhinox files. You are right, though, that there is a paper that talks about this, and it is real. And I, if I, you guys can tell me if I'm wrong about this, but I think the answer is to use multiple constellations that don't have the same sensitivity. So don't rely only on GPS. Use GLONASS, use Galileo, use Beidou. The more, the better. And then you won't have that issue. The 24 hours files doesn't matter. It is true that currently I've been, I wouldn't say lazy, 
but I haven't made it a priority to uh, use arcs that might start five minutes before midnight and end 15 minutes after midnight. Do you know what I mean? Like it's a 20 minute arc that happens to cross midnight. And it's trivial to fix that. <laughs> I just haven't made it a priority, right? All you have to do is take an hour or two from the day before and attach it, right? Because Fourier analysis isn't, isn't going to care about midnight. What we care about is sign of elevation angle, right? So anyway, in PBO, well, we did this automatically, and I just haven't done it yet here, but I've thought about it. The GNSS would ruffle apply to a mobile antenna. <clears throat> it, GNSS reflect sort of can be used for a mobile antenna, but you'll have to make your own SNR file or modify our translation file. And the reason is your azimuth and elevation angles, especially the issue is your elevation angles won't be correct if it's a really fast <laughs> ship. And uh, so the header information will be wrong for your arc. And that just means Maybe you should estimate the position of your ship and read that file that has your positions, your ship positions in it when you compute azimuth and elevation angle. And if you do that, you can use GNSS Reflect. We did something like that. For, I did something like that for the ice sheet community because some of those ice sheets actually move pretty quickly, not like a ship, but you know, it had been there five years, so it had moved quite a bit in five years because it's on a glacier. Well, it's on an ice sheet. But um, so I put in something very simple, and that would be what you would have to do, is you would have to be sure that the elevation angles were correct. Any other questions? How do you ensure how do you, how are you sure that you've got the appropriate vertical distance when you're measuring tides? Um, well, I mean, I, that's a good question. The quality control is key. Um, you use the Fresnel zone mapping tools to make sure that to first order, you're not doing something silly. And, um, you guys have anything better than looking at out, removing outliers that suggest that maybe you're, you know, you should change your azimuth limits. Sometimes photographs can be very helpful. Like uh, you look and you look closely and there's a dock in your reflection zone because you didn't notice it. So you rerun the data without that region, with that region removed. Yeah, I guess there are places where the tides are big enough, you don't know that vertical height effectively because it's changing the time. But well, it doesn't is, matter. I, no. You know, this is why I, I showed the case from Costa Rica. I mean, that was real. I could never understand why my results from Costa Rica were so bad. And it was only after years I looked at these old Google Earth images and I'm like, you know, I'm measuring the sand half the time. And Simon has a beautiful uh, result where he just shows, I guess you just have <laughs> high tides. <Sure. laughs> He's got like half the tides. Um, so sometimes I, I yeah, you know, I hope that helps. But, you know, it, it's, it takes some experience. I mean, I, I've seen papers where people have written papers for removing outliers. And I took the coordinates from the paper and I put it in my Fresnel zone mapper. And sure enough, there's a boat, a ship, not a boat, a ship, a container ship, a huge ship that sits in front of the GPS antenna sometimes, not all the time. So I'm sympathetic. Sometimes the data look great. Sometimes it looks like it's reflecting off a ship. So it's, if I would, you know, encourage people to not put their GPS sites 
or GNSS sites in active harbors. That would be my recommendation to not do that, but so many are. How accurate? Well, does your type gauge tell you your value in ITRF? If that's your definition of accuracy, we're way better. But if your question is, are we more precise than a traditional tide gauge? No, we're not as precise. Um, and it depends on the site. Uh, Felipe uh, was in charge of a working group that did comparisons about that kind of thing. And it depends on the site and the assumptions you make. How smooth is the uh, series? Uh, so what kind of models you use you guys want to say something yeah well i'm going to show a slide about that tomorrow um, okay as you say it's very dependent on the site in the end that's the most you can say and you know when you say it depends on the site you're also saying it depends on the receiver to a certain extent yeah. it oh, yeah. depends on the antenna and um but i don't feel so bad about it anymore when i've done comparisons with tight gauges and I found places where tight gauges get time wrong. And honestly, that is something GPS never does. <laughs> but so, I mean, we all sensors have problems. All sensors have problems. And, uh, and, and Simon is going to talk tomorrow about how there are some unique features of GNSS and the fact that it actually measures position and water level simultaneously that are unique. And useful because uh, we know that these tight gauges are not on stable platforms. And so there's been a lot of effort to put high quality GNSS instruments nearby for that reason. So they recognize it because they want to know if water level is going up or down. So they know they need GNSS for that. So one thing, GNSSIR can do is do both of them at the same time. Um, but I would not say as precisely as a, a radar gauge. I wouldn't say that. <clears throat> but again, not all radar gauges are the same quality. Is that a correct statement, Simon? Yeah, and they have their own problems. We have one in Gibraltar where a, a big boom comes underneath it and just completely wrecks the radar data, whereas the GPS can still measure. Yeah. All right. So I really appreciate these. Uh, the person who asked about uh, wind speed and water level, that'll be discussed tomorrow. So keep that question. And uh, thank you so many people for coming. Uh, we're going to, I think we're going to stop. So, so I'm going to send out, as, when this finishes, I will send out the invitation for tomorrow. I basically didn't want to send out two invites at the same time, because I feared, you know, that would just lead to people clicking on the wrong one. So I, after we're done here, I'll, uh, later this afternoon, I'll send out a new invite. Uh, thank you for your questions. They were all good. And um, we learn by uh, hearing your questions. So thank, I want to thank all the panelists and I want to thank all the attendees and anybody from North or Central America who, attended this. I'm just astounded. So thank you for uh, sh sharing your free breakfast time with us and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye.